This piece is called The Rediscovery of North America. This is something that I wrote now. <laughs> A few hours after midnight, on the morning of October 12th in the Julian calendar of the West, or October 21st according to the modern Gregorian calendar, Juan Rodriguez Bermeo, a lookout aboard the Caravel Pinta, spotted the coast of probably either San Salvador Island or Samana Cay in the Bahamas and shouted his exclamation into the darkness. It was the 18th year of the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella of Castile, and these mariners were their emissaries. Cristoforo Colombo, or Christopher Dove, as it would be in English, commander of the fleet of three ships, gave orders to make, take in sail and to lay close hauled five miles offshore, awaiting the rise of the sun. The seas were rolling, strong winds tore at the crests of the waves, a gibbous moon was setting in a clear sky. As they awaited dawn, Columbus let it be known that he had earlier seen a light on the island a few hours before midnight. The ships were making about 10 knots when Bermeo cried out. By his claim, the commander would have had to have seen the light at a distance of more than 30 miles over the curve of the earth. Columbus thereby took for himself the lifetime pension promised the first man to sight land. Of Senor Bermeo, history has little more to say. It was rumored that he converted to Islam and died fighting alongside the Moors, who had that year of 1492 lost their final stronghold in Spain. In the same year, Jews were evicted from the country by royal edict. We do not know what Columbus and his men envisioned when they came ashore on Samana Cay or San Salvador, the island the local Arawak people called Guanahani. In a chain, the Spanish were to call the Ducayas. But we know that in those first few hours, a process began we now call an incursion. In the name of distant and abstract powers, the Spanish began an appropriation of the place, a seizure of its people, its elements, whatever could be carried off. What followed for decades upon this discovery were the acts of criminals. Murder, rape, theft, kidnapping, vandalism, child molestation, acts of cruelty, torture, and humiliation. Bartolomé de las Casas, who arrived in Hispaniola in 1502 and later became a priest, was an eyewitness to what he called the obdurate and dreadful temper of the Spanish, which attended their unlimited and close-fisted avarice, their vicious search for wealth. One day, in front of las Casas, the Spanish dismembered, beheaded, or raped 3,000 people. Such inhumanities and barbarisms were committed in my sight, he says, as no age can parallel. The Spanish cut off the legs of children who ran from them. They poured people full of boiling soap. They made bets as to who with one sweep of his sword could cut a person in half. They loosed dogs that devoured an Indian like a hog at first sight in less than a moment. They used nursing infants for dog food. It was a continuous recreational slaughter, practiced by men who felt slights to their personages, imagined insults to their religion, or felt thwarted in their search for gold or sexual congress. These words of Las Casas, who said, I resolve silently to pass over lest I should terrify the reader with the horror a more graphic recounting of these incidents, were written at Valencia in 1542 at the request of historians to display to the world the enormities, etc., the Spaniards committed in America to their eternal ignominy. Las Casas writes in the opening pages of his treatise, I earnestly beg and desire all men to be persuaded that this summary was not published upon any private design sinister ends, or affection in favor of or prejudice of any particular nation, but for the public emolument and advantage of all true Christians and moral men throughout this world. I single out these episodes of depravity, not so much to indict the Spanish as to make two points. First, 
This incursion, this harmful road into the new world, quickly became a ruthless, angry search for wealth. It set a tone in the Americas. The quest for personal possessions was to be, from the outset, a series of raids, irresponsible and criminal, a spree in which an end to it, the slaves, the timber, the pearls, the fur, the precious ores, and later arable land, coal, oil, and iron ore, was never visible in which an end to it had no meaning. The assumption of an imperial right conferred by God, sanctioned by the state and enforced by a militia, the assumption of unquestioned superiority over a resident people, based not on morality but on race and cultural comparison, or let me say it plainly, on ignorance, on a fundamental illiteracy, the assumption that one is due wealth in North America reverberates in the journals of people on the Oregon Trail, in the public speeches of 19th century industrialists, and in 20th century politics. You can hear it today in the rhetoric of timber barons in my home state of Oregon, standing before the last of the old growth forest, irritated that anyone is saying, enough, it is enough. What Columbus began then, what Pizarro and Cortez and Coronado perpetuated, is not isolated in the past. We see a continuance in the presence of this brutal, avaricious behavior, a profound abuse of the place during the course of centuries of demand for material wealth. We need only look for verification at the acid-burned forests of New Hampshire, at the cauterized soils of Iowa, or at the collapse of the San Joaquin Valley into caverns emptied of their fossil waters. The second point I wish to make is that this violent corruption needn't define us. Looking back on the Spanish incursion, we can take the measure of the horror and assert that we will not be bound by it. We can say, yes, this happened, and we are ashamed. We repudiate the greed, we recognize and condemn the evil, and we see how the harm has been perpetuated, but 500 years later we intend to mean something else in the world. Imagine Guanahani, where Columbus put ashore on that windy Friday morning. It is the most seaward of the Bahamas. If we mean specifically San Salvador, it is today a quiet, sparsely inhabited island with a small village, Coburn Town, and up the road a single hotel visited mostly by divers who come here to see an impressive array of tropical fish, of underwater plants and creatures, and just offshore, massive walls where the bottom drops off into a bottomless blue. The island itself has changed dramatically since Columbus arrived. Its surface, in essence, was scraped bare, and then, in the centuries that followed, it was repopulated by refugees, people of complex origin, a mixture of local and foreign plants and animals. The same is true across much of the Caribbean. We cannot s today see what Columbus saw, the fabric of animals and plants and people was utterly torn apart. It is hard to conceive how amazed the Spanish must have been in those first few years by the sight of crocodiles, hummingbirds, and the roseate spoonbill, the anaconda and the jaguar, rhinoceros beetles and howler monkeys. But these ultimately were only beautiful distractions the conquistadors would throw away this splendor in a moment, and did, for the silver of Potosí. Had the Maryland darter, the dusky seaside sparrow, the Palo Verde blue butterfly, or the plains grizzly been able to read, they would have seen their own fate sealed here. The Spanish sought a narrowly defined wealth. Las Casas writes, now, the ultimate end and scope that incited the Spaniards to endeavor the extirpation and desolation of this people was gold only that thereby growing opulent in a short time they might arrive at once at such degrees and dignities as were in no ways consistent with their persons. We lost in this manner whole communities of people, plants, and animals because a handful of men wanted gold and silver, title to land, the privileges of aristocracy, slaves, stables of little boys, we lost languages, epistemologies, books, ceremonies, systems of logic and metaphysics, a long, hideous carnage. It is perilous, of course, 
to suggest that we ourselves would have behaved differently. My generation turns back but a few pages to scenes in the villages of Vietnam where our goals were simply political. I also mean to take the long view here. But it is not good to forget, not to face squarely what happened. The way the world forgot the extermination of Armenians in Turkey 25 years before Buchenwald. And if we say, yes, all right, this was us and the pattern continues, then how are we to understand it? How can we clarify for ourselves what went wrong? How can we claim not that we are different, but that we wish seeing what has come in the wake of our acts to set off now in a different direction? A distinction that is crucial and instructive in the face of this dilemma is suggested by Svetlana Todorov, the French writer and critic in The Conquest of America. He says that what we see in the New World under the Spanish is an imposition of will. It is an incursion with no proposals. The Spanish impose, they do not propose. I think it is possible to view the entire colonial enterprise beginning in 1492 in those terms. Instead of an encounter with the other in which we proposed certain ideas, proposals based on assumptions of equality, respectfully tendered, our encounters were distinguished by a stern, relentless imposition of ideas, religious, economic, and social ideas we deemed superior, if not unimpeachable. Our trouble with the new world, a world that was intended to refuel an old world which had in some sense grown effete, has been that from the beginning we have imposed, not proposed. We never said to the people or the animals or the plants or the rivers or the mountains, what do you think of this? We said what we thought and bent to our will whatever resisted. I do not suggest lightly or as a kind of romance that we might have addressed the animals, the trees, the land itself. The idea of this kind of courtesy is more ancient than primitive and the wisdom of it the ineffable and subtle intertwining of living organisms on the earth is confirmed today by molecular biology and atmospheric chemistry. To acknowledge the interdependence is simply a good and wise habit of mind. When we arrived in the new world, we came to talk, not to listen. Now that we have begun to listen to the land, to take into account in our planning the biological and chemical response of a particular landscape, what we are hearing is the voice that answered Juan Rodriguez Bermeo, but which was never heeded. In the beginning, it was an antiphony we wanted no part of. We're anxious now to know what the land has to say to us, how it responds to our use of it, and we are curious, too, about indigenous systems of natural philosophy, how our Western proposals might be answered by some bit of this local wisdom and insight into how to conduct our lives here so that it might be rich so that they might be richer, and so that what is left of what we have subjugated might determine its own life. What wealth did Bermeo cry out in anticipation of? Let us be kind, as we hope historians will be kind to us, and say that for him and for many others on those three small ships, perhaps the hummingbird would have been enough. The hummingbird, fresh food after five weeks at sea, and the astonishing lives of the Arawak. But the record tells us that in the end, there was very little imagination here. It was gold, silver, pearls, slaves, and sexual intercourse. It was venal greed, a failure of the imagination, the reduction of desire to its most banal elements. True wealth, sanctity, companionship, wisdom, joy, serenity. These things were not to be had without an offer of the heart and soul and time. The Spaniards had no time, and we find it easy to say on the evidence that they were heartless and immoral. The only wealth they could imagine is what they took. The Spanish wanted no communion with America, the place or its people. Residence, except residence construed as land ownership, was not of interest to them. America was not to be a home, or what a home implied, the responsibilities and obligations of adult life. They had left that behind in Europe, had traded it away for lawlessness. If we say that the elements of true wealth come with the maintenance of a home, as I think is possible, then we have to say that the Spanish and their descendants were not to find true wealth in America, 
until they discovered the America they had missed. The true wealth that America offered, wealth that could turn exploitation into residency, greed into harmony, was to come from one thing, the cultivation and achievement of local knowledge. It was in the pursuit of local knowledge alone that one could comprehend the notion of a home and its attendant responsibilities. So the first question at Guanahani might better have been, who are these people? What is this land? We rarely think anymore of this geography, of how the land was peopled. Start in the Bahamas with an Arawak people, the Lucayo, and then turn up north and west to the mainland to the country of the Calusa, and on north to the separate landscapes of the Apalachi, the Creek, the Chickasaw, then east and north, the Cherokee, Delaware, Susquehanna, the Onondaga, Mahican, and Abenaki, back west, Huron, Ottawa, Chippewa, Plains Ojibwa, Assiniboine, Crow, Shoshone, into the northwest, Salish, Nez Perce, Coeur d'Alene, Yakima, Snoqualmie, Chehalis, and down the coast, Tillamook, Sayuslaw, Coos, Yurok, Pomo, Maidu, Chumash, back to the east, Paiute, Havasupai, Papago, Pima, Chiricahua, Apache, Mescalero, Apache, Tiwa, Tano, Tewa, Keres, Santo Domingo, Powaki, Hickoria, Apache, Kiowa, Arapaho, Pawnee, Kansa, Osage, Shawnee, and back south, Catawba, Hichiti, Timakua. This is to leave out all the tribes of the north, Dog Rib, Hare, Kuchin, the northwest coast, Tlingit and Coquitl, of Mexico, Tarahumara, Aztec, Maya, and to the south of them, Mosquito and Kuna, and all of South America, from the Caribe and Timote to the Yagan and Ona. More than a thousand distinct cultures, a thousand mutually unintelligible language, a thousand ways of knowing. How can one compare intimacy with the facets of this knowledge to the possession of gold? How could we have squandered such wisdom in that search? Imagine the physical place. It is not often either that we call this to mind, start in the same region, the Florida Keys, that white light, Okefenokee Swamp, the Piedmont Plateau, James River, the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, hardwood forests of the White Mountains, Mount Katahdin, Finger Lakes, Allegheny Mountains, Cumberland Plateau, Kentucky River, Indiana Dunes, Wisconsin Dells, Minnesota Lakes, Laurentian Divide, Shortgrass Prairie, Missouri Breaks, Judith Basin, Middle Fork of the Salmon, Mount Rainier, Olympic Peninsula, Columbia Bar, California Redwoods, Tuolumne Meadows, Black Rock Desert, the Wasatch Range, Medicine Bow Mountains, South Fork of the Platte, Front Range, Headwaters of the Canadian, Sangre de Cristo, Mogollon Rim, Sonoran Desert, Edwards Plateau, Brazos River, Big Thicket, Lake Pontchartrain, Chattahoochee River, Everglades. And I leave out again all that to the north, Thalon River, Great Bear Lake, the Brooks Range, Glacier Bay, and to the south, the Chihuahuan Desert, Yucatan Peninsula, Mosquito Coast, the Darien Isthmus, and South America, Lake Titicaca, Mato Grosso, Atacama Desert, Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego. It would take a lifetime to list even in these few places the trees and flowers, the butterflies and fish, the small mammals, the kinds of deer and cats, the migratory and resident birds, and to say the most rudimentary things about their relationships, how they know and reflect each other. This, along with the people we ignored, was a wealth that didn't register until much of it was gone, or until, like the people, it was a tattered, diluted remnant sequestered on a reservation. This brief litany of names, though all are imposed, 
should awaken a sense of the breadth of this landscape, of how by turns it is strange and comprehensible, familiar and unfathomable. It is still in some real sense the new world. These are still places with which we might reciprocate. Camus said that certain cities, he had in mind Oran on the Algerian coast, exorcised the landscape. We have a way of life that ostracizes the land. Cadwallader Calden, John Bartram, Peter Collinson, Mark Catsby, Thomas Say, John Kirk Townsend, Thomas Nuttall, John James Audubon, all were able at least to describe what they found, but this extensive knowledge was ultimately regarded as only a kind of entertainment, decorative information, a series of puzzles for science to elucidate. It was not, never taken to be what it in fact is, a description of home. How then do we know the land to discover what more may be there than merchantable timber, grazable prairies, recoverable oars, dammable water, nettable fish? It is by looking upon the land not as its possessor, but as a companion. To achieve this, one must, I think, cultivate intimacy as one would with a human being. And that would mean being in a place, taking up residence in a place. Let us choose for an example a residence in the basin of the Kentucky River, a tributary of the Ohio River. Because we ourselves are recent arrivals, we would have to read local history. We would have to find a memory of the place through the journals and records of those of us who first came across the Alleghenies and over the Cumberland Plateau, Thomas Walker through the Cumberland Gap for the Loyal Land Company and residents of the proposed colonies of Transylvania and Vandalia would have to read these observations against each other and then read in the anthropological and archaeological literature about those we moved out of the way, the Shawnee and Miami, and about those they followed here, the Hopewell, and those they followed, the Adena, as far back as we could go. And then we would come forward looking in the archives of towns and counties for records of observation that spanned enough years so that the human span of three score and ten was not the span we measured the country by. We would have to memorize and remember the land, walk it, eat from its soils and from the animals that ate its plants. We would have to know its winds, inhale its airs, observe the sequence of its flowers in the spring and the range of its birds. To inquire after this knowledge is to make our proposals, to answer the antiphony. To be intimate with the land like this is to enclose it in the same moral universe we occupy, to include it in the meaning of the word community. It has been my privilege to travel to see a lot of country. And in those travels, I have learned of several ways to become intimate with the land, ways I try to practice. I remember a Nunamiut man at Anaktuvik Pass in the Brooks Range in Alaska named Justice Mekiana. I was there working on a book, and I asked him what he did when he went into a foreign landscape. He said, I listen. And a man named Levine Williams, a Koyukon Athabascan, who spoke sternly to a friend after he had made an innocent remark about how intelligent people were, saying to him, every animal knows way more than you do. And another man, an Inuk, watching a group of polar bear biologists on Baffin Island comparing notes on the migration paths of polar bears in an effort to predict where they might go. Kwaji Zhao Jung Ongitut. He said softly, it can't be learned. I remember a Kamba man in Kenya, Kamoya Kimeo, a companion in the stone deserts west of Lake Trakana and a dozen other men telling me, you know how to see, learn how to mark the country. And he and others teaching me to sit down in one place for two or three hours and look. When we enter the landscape to learn something, we're obligated, I think, to pay attention rather than constantly to pose questions, to approach the land as we would a person by opening an intelligent conversation, and to say in one place, to stay in one place, to make of that one long observation a fully dilated experience. We will always be rewarded if we give the land credit for more than we imagine, and if we imagine it as being more complex even than language. In these ways, we begin, I think, 
to find a home, to sense how to fit a place. In Spanish, la carencia refers to a place on the ground where one feels secure, a place from which one's strength of character is drawn. It comes from the verb querer, to desire, but this verb also carries the sense of accepting a challenge, as in a game. In Spain, carencia is most often used to describe the spot in a bull ring where a wounded bull goes to gather himself, the place he returns to after his painful encounters with the picadors and the bandarillos. It is unfortunate that the word is comprised in this way, compromised in this way, for the idea itself is quite beautiful, a place in which we know exactly who we are, the place from which we speak our deepest beliefs. Carencia conveys more than hearth, and it carries the sense of being challenged in the case of a bullfight by something lethal, which one may want no part of. I would like to take this word carencia beyond its ordinary meaning and suggest that it applies to our challenge in the modern world, that our search for a carencia is both a response to threat and a desire to find out who we are. And the discovery of a carencia, I believe, hinges on the perfection of a sense of place. A sense of place must include, at the very least, knowledge of what is inviolate about the relationship between a people and the place they occupy, and certainly, too, how the destruction of this relationship, or the failure to attend to it, wounds people. Living in North America and trying to develop a philosophy of place, a recognition of the spiritual and psychological dimensions of geography, inevitably brings us back to our beginnings here, to the Spanish incursion. The Spanish experience was to amass wealth and go home. Those of us who have stayed, who delight in the litanies of this landscape, and who can imagine no deeper pleasure than the fullness of our residency here, look with horror on the survival of that imperial framework in North America, the physical destruction of a local landscape to increase the wealth of people who don't live there or to supply materials to buyers in distant places who will never know the destruction that process leaves behind. If in a philosophy of place we examine our love of the land, I do not mean a romantic love, but the love Edward Wilson calls by Ophelia, love of what is alive, and the physical context in which it lives, which we call the hollow, or the cane break, or the woody draw, or the canyon, if in measuring our love we feel anger, I think we have a further obligation. It is to develop a hard and focused anger at what continues to be done to the land, not so that people can survive, but so that a relatively few people can amass wealth. I'm aware that these words, or words like them, have historically invoked revolution. But I ask myself, where is the man or woman standing before lifeless porpoises and strangled and bloated in a beach cast drift net, or standing on farmland ankle deep in soil gone to flower dust, or flying over the Cascade Mountains and seeing the clear cut stretching for 40 miles, the sun baked earth, the streams running with mud? Who does not want to say, Forgive me, thou bleeding earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers? If we ask ourselves, what has heightened our sense of loss in North America? What has made us feel around in the dark for a place where we might take a stand? We would have to answer that it is the particulars of what is now called the environmental crisis. Acid rain, soil erosion, times beach, falling populations of wild animals, clear cutting Three Mile Island. But what we really face, I think, is something much larger, something that goes back to Guanahani and what Columbus decided to do, that series of acts, theft, rape, and murder, of which the environmental crisis is symptomatic. What we face is a crisis of culture, a crisis of character. 500 years after the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria sailed into the Bahamas, we are asking ourselves, what has been the price of the assumptions those ships carried particularly about the primacy of material wealth. One of our deepest frustrations as a culture, I think, must be that we have made so extreme an investment in mining the continent, 
created such an infrastructure of nearly endless jobs predicated on the removal and distribution of trees, water, minerals, fish, plants, and...